Today we're talking about the First Crusade. Well, it's been two weeks since we've been here on this podcast. I'm really sorry about that. Last week was Canadian Thanksgiving, and this week was our Canadian election. I worked on the election this year, so I was actually at the poll for the whole day, 8.15 in the morning, all the way till 10.45 at night. So needless to say, I didn't have a chance to record the podcast. It was a really long day. But I have really been enjoying all the research for this part of church history. Now, I want to give a shout out to one of my listeners. He is in elementary school, but he loves learning about church history. So I want to say hi to Zach, and I'm so glad that you're listening. Now, we're still talking about the Crusades, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about the First Crusade. Now, to tell the story of the First Crusade, I have to touch on some of the things I talked about in the last episode, but I would recommend listening to that episode as well, and it's called The People's Crusade. All right, so let's jump in. 1095 was the start of 200 years of war. And for the Islamists, it's a war that's never really ended. Muhammad died in the year 632, and his followers divided into two groups. The Shia, who believed the leader of the caliphate must be a descendant of Muhammad, and the Sunni, who believed the leader could be elected by the Muslims. The caliphate was, or actually still is today, the belief that the world would be an Islamic state and would be ruled by one ruler. This was prophesied in the teachings of Muhammad. The end times teaching is kind of a mirror to the teaching of the Bible about the end times. As a mirror, I mean the exact opposite in an almost identical way. All right, the basic idea of the Christian teaching about end times is that an evil man known as the Antichrist will come and have total world domination. His terror will last about seven years, and he will enter the temple of God in the middle of that time period and demand worship of himself. He will demand everyone worship him. There will be a false prophet that will kill anyone who does not worship the Antichrist. At the end of the seven years, Jesus will return for one final battle, and the Antichrist will be defeated. Now, the Islamic prophecy is that the Messiah will return, sign a treaty for seven years, bring the Kaaba to Jerusalem and put it in the temple, and demand everyone worship him. Jesus will return and say Islam is the true religion and will demand everyone worship Islam and will kill anyone who does not follow Islam. If you want to get a more in-depth analysis of the difference between the church and Islam, and also the similarities when it comes to end times, I have a video about this that I will put in the show notes. But it's important to know both the church and Islam, what they believed about end times during this time period. You see, the church was making pilgrimages to Jerusalem and wanted it to be clean and pure for Jesus's return. And the Muslims were trying to build the caliphate, getting ready for their Messiah. At the same time, The Shia and the Sunni were fighting over who would rule the caliphate, and they're still at war today. When Muhammad died in the year 632, Islam had already started to take over large areas of the Arab world. But in the next 350 years, they took over more than two-thirds of the Christian world. Christians were forced to wear a leather belt, and the Jews had to wear the Star of David. This was showing that they were dhimmi, or a low-class citizen. They had to pay tax to the Muslims in order to be allowed to, well, live. The areas of the world that had been the foundation of the Christian world was now dominated by Islam. As Christian pilgrims traveled to Jerusalem, they returned with horror stories of how Christians were being treated. One story was of a large caravan of Christians who were attacked on Easter Sunday, and the entire group was murdered. Now, the truth was bad, but not as bad as the story that was being told. The group was attacked on Easter, and they were attacked by a tribe of Muslims. However, another group of Muslims heard about what had happened and came to rescue the Christians. More than half of the Christians were murdered, which was horrible. But at the same time, they were rescued by other Muslims. Now, this story is a perfect example of what the Crusades were. 
Islam and Christians fighting. There are times the Christians are, well, kind of almost monsters. And there are times the Muslims are monsters. And there are stories that are stretched or only half told. So if you're listening to someone who says the church was completely bad and the crusades were something we should be ashamed of, they either don't know the whole story or they're purposely only telling you half of the story. On the same note, if someone believes the crusades were great and you know we should just do it again, also they probably don't know the whole story. But put yourself in the shoes of the men and women living in the Christian countries. They are hearing stories of their fellow Christians being persecuted and about something called a caliphate. And the goal of the caliphate was world domination. And the goal seemed to be working. There have only been a few places they've attacked that they haven't been able to seize the land. Not only that, Islamic pirates have taken over trade routes in the Mediterranean Sea. Ships are being attacked by these pirates. Everything taken and the sailors either killed or taken as slaves. Christian women and children are being kidnapped and taken as slaves. Africa is under attack. Italy is under attack. Spain is under attack. Then the Pope receives a letter from the church in Constantine begging for help. They are about to be overthrown and taken over by the caliphate. Mohammed himself had attacked this area before he died. And for over 300 years, the Muslims had constantly attacked the area. And now they were starting to look like they might win. 300 years of fighting these people just trying to survive. Now they're calling on their fellow Christians for help. What would you do? And then you hear the Holy Sepulchre has been destroyed. This is the most holy church in Jerusalem. A man named Peter the Hermit returned from his pilgrimage to the Holy Land and was on a mission to build an army and march on the Holy Land and free it from Islamic rule and rebuild the Holy Sepulchre. Pope Urban II called a council of Clement on November the 18th. It lasted until November 28th of that year. That was the year 1095. He read a letter he had received from the Roman Emperor asking for help. Today we call this area Byzantine, but at the time they called themselves Rome. The crowd was ready to fight and tens of thousands joined. But when the Pope said they would leave in a few months, Peter the Hermit was demanding that they leave now. He left with a massive army, over 30,000 men, women and children. By the time the Pope's army left in April, the People's Crusade had returned and only 3,000 had survived from the 30,000 that left. They never reached Jerusalem. You can hear about their journey in the last episode, The People's Crusade. In April, the first official crusade marched out of town and towards Jerusalem. They were an army of 60,000 men. And of those 60,000, 10,000 were knights. In October, they arrived in Constantine and the emperor was happy and also surprised to see such a massive army. It was much larger than he expected. He reminded them that the land captured had to be returned to Rome and not taken by the army. As they marched towards Jerusalem, they attacked the cities in order to take the land and give it back to the Roman Empire. The first place they came to was Nicaea. They surrounded the city and within six weeks, they had taken the city by force and the land was returned to Rome. It was a miracle. They then went to Antioch. Now Antioch had been a great Christian city. It was the first place in the world that the word Christian had been used. From the very start of the church, this city had been essential, and now it was in the hands of Islam, and the Christian population was all considered demi. You can read a lot about the city of Antioch in the book in the Bible, the book of Acts. The city of Antioch would not be easy to defeat. In the last 500 years, it had only fallen when it was defeated by traitors from the inside. This city was a very large Christian population. So the crusaders surrounded the city. On the first day, the Muslims went out of the gates to build a giant moat. On the second day, the Muslims demanded all of the Christians go out to work on the moat. The Christians all left the city to work on the moat. 
But the Muslims then locked the gates, leaving the Christians locked outside of the city. The crusaders who were camped around the city now suddenly had to feed, clothe, and house tens of thousands of Christians. Then winter hit. It was cold, and there was not enough food for everyone. People got sick and started dying. Disease spread through the camp. When you're cold and tired and starving, your body doesn't fight disease well. Because they ran out of food, they had to kill their horses and eat them. It was a very long, brutal, horrible winter. As spring arrived, they heard word that there was a Muslim army of 50,000 coming to attack them. They would be trapped between the wall of Antioch and the Muslim army. It seemed hopeless. But then, an Arminian living inside the city of Antioch offered to help them. He let some of the crusaders over the wall, and the crusaders opened the gates. The army rushed into the city and immediately started killing everyone in sight. The Muslims fought back, and the battle was a bloody one. It looked as if the crusaders might lose. Then a man named Peter, not Peter the Hermit, a different Peter, Peter Bartholomew, found a sword. He said God showed him where to look, and it was the Holy Lance the very sword that had pierced the side of Jesus on the cross. Peter stands where everyone can see him and holds out the sword. He proclaims he has found the holy lance and with God before them, they can not lose. The crusaders then have a sudden burst of power and attack again. This time they win. Antioch is captured and the land returned to Rome. The crusaders then march on and they come to Marat, what is today Syria. By the time they arrive, it's winter again, and they've been on this march now for over a year. It's November, and winter is looking to be harsh again. They build a large tower that they could move towards the city, and they use it to scale the city walls. Once again, the crusaders kill everyone they see, and once again, it's a bloody battle. At the end of the battle, the crusaders are again trapped outside walls and unable to take the land. They're hungry and do not want a winter like the last one. To show the Muslims they are people to be feared, they do the most gruesome thing. They take the bodies of the Muslims that died during the battle and build a large fire. They then cook the dead bodies and eat them, making sure everyone can see what they're doing. This barbaric act does exactly what it's supposed to do. The story spreads and everyone is terrified of the crusading army. They attack the city and the city surrenders. They then travel on and arrive at more cities. This time they're met with a different reaction. The town basically says, come in and take whatever you want. Just please don't eat us. Some cities are actually bought by the crusaders and they're willing to allow the army to pass unharmed for a sum of money. Some of the Muslims even end up fighting alongside the crusaders. Remember, there's two groups of Muslims at war with each other at this time, so they're happy to see their enemies fall. As they get closer to Jerusalem, the army leaders have a problem. The problem's name is Peter Bartholomew. His finding the sword saved the day, but now he's starting to be a little bit of a problem. He keeps having visions from Bible characters, and he demands the generals follow his visions since they're from God. In one vision, Peter says that Jesus told him he hates the Jews, which means we're clearly sure that one didn't come from Jesus. This idea that Jesus hates Jews spread through the camp and built up a feeling that would perhaps be one of the reasons this particular crusade ends the way it does. One of the generals is very vocal about his disbelief in Peter. He doesn't think the lance is holy, and he thinks all of his visions are made up, and that Peter is, in fact, insane. When the general dies after getting sick, Peter says that the general came to him in a vision and apologized for not believing in him, and that God had sent the general to hell just for a little while until he paid for his unbelief in in Peter. The other generals see that many of the soldiers are following Peter, and since he's, well, insane, that's a problem. Then Peter calls a meeting. He stands before the group. 
God says we must attack Jerusalem now with no planning and anyone who doesn't attack with us must be beheaded. Now, this is a huge problem. The generals have a plan and beheading their own army isn't in it. So the generals say that Peter is full of it. He's a liar. So Peter demands a trial by fire. So the crusaders build a huge fire and they tell Peter to run through the fire. If he makes it to the other side without being hurt, they'll believe him. If he dies, he was lying. They then take an arrow and shoot the arrow into the fire. The arrow burns up before it reaches the other side. Peter grabs his holy lance, holds it high in the air, and runs as fast as he can straight into the fire and out the other side. He survives, but is badly burnt. He died of his wounds 12 days later. The morale of the army hits an all-time low. Peter was a liar. The lance is not real. And Peter is dead. June 7, 1099, four years after the Council of Clement, the crowd arrives at Jerusalem. They had marched out as an army of 50,000, but they are now an army of 12,000. 38,000 men have died. They died in battle. They have starved to death. They have died of diseases. Now this smaller army of 12,000 reaches the walls of Jerusalem. As the group arrives and they can see the city in the distance, some of the knights kneel and cry at the sight of the holy city. Today we understand the effects of war on people, but PTSD wasn't something people understood in the year 1099. These men had seen things and done things they never expected to see or do. While some were knights, most were farmers and peasants, and they had watched their friends die. Now they see the city that they have come to rescue, but the walls are high and there's no way in. There's one pond of water close to the city and the crusaders try to drink from it, but the Islamic armies fire arrows and kill the men trying to drink. So the crusaders can only drink at night. Then the Islamic armies begin killing animals that are drinking during the day. The animals then fall into the water bleeding and the water becomes infected. The soldiers that drink it become sick and die. The men then find a river, but it's too far from camp. So they kill animals and try to use their skin to carry the water back to camp. But the skin wasn't cleaned properly and the water makes them sick. So trapped again outside the walls of a city, tired, sick, and starving to death, the army needs help. Then Peter the Hermit stands up on the Mount of Olives and preaches a message. The army is inspired to fight and morale is once again on their side. They build a catapult to shoot fire into the city, but they're unsure if they've built it correct. So they find a prisoner someone who had been caught for spying, and they tie him to a catapult. They then shoot him over the walls as a test. Unfortunately, they hadn't actually made the catapult right. He hits the bottom of the wall and is killed. So they need to keep working on the catapult. They also cut down trees and they build a 50-foot siege tower, a battering ram, and more catapults. On the night of July 14th, the Crusaders attack from two different positions. One position was stopped by the Muslim armies, but the other one broke through. The armies then have a great battle. The second group then also breaks through and the battle becomes even more fierce. The Christians were outnumbered, but soon it was obvious they would be the victors. The battle ended and the Crusaders had freed Jerusalem. They marched to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and prayed in the church. I wish I could end the story here. I wish I could say the Crusaders had heard about their brothers and sisters and the Jews who were being persecuted and had come and rescued them and won the battle against all odds. I wish I could just end the podcast here. But history like I've said before, is not a Disney story where the villains are only villains and the heroes are only heroes. 
in real life, everyone can be either a hero or a villain, and most people are both, depending on who's telling the story. The Jews, as the battle began, took their families and hid inside a synagogue. The Muslims who were not fighting and some who had retreated from the fight hid inside the Dome of the Rock. The Christians, after praying in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, then went on a killing streak. They entered the Dome of the Rock and killed everyone, men, women, and children. The blood was so deep in the building that it was like a river and it flowed above their ankles. Then they went to the synagogue where the Jews were hiding and they lit it on fire. Everyone hiding in the synagogue was burnt to death. Once the news of the massacre of civilians reached the Pope, he was angry. He declared that everyone who's involved in this part of the attack were excommunicated and no longer part of the church. This was something that was new to war. Until this point in history, war ended with killing civilians and looting. This was just how war was done. The idea that someone could commit murder during war was a concept people didn't understand. But the church would not sanction these acts. In the Ten Commandments, the third command is this, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, I've always believed that this means you don't curse. But the Jews have always understood this command differently. They believe this command is saying, Do not do evil in the Lord's name. This is what happened on that day. Evil was done in the Lord's name. Was the caliphate a threat on the whole world? Yes, and by the way, it's still a threat on the whole world today. Were the crusaders right in going to war? Yes, I personally believe they were. They were attacking someone whose main goal was world domination. Was the three years brutal and did they possibly lose their mind during this ordeal? Yes, I can't imagine going through all they went through and come out the other side as a normal person. Was the freeing of Jerusalem a miracle? Yes, they were outnumbered and the city walls were massive. Was it evil that they killed men, women, and children who were civilians? Yes, it was evil. The killing in the end of the First Crusade was based on hate. And had Jesus returned at that moment, like they all believed he would, he would have been very angry. The generals were asked if they would appoint a new king of Jerusalem. The answer was no. Jesus was the only one who could have the title King of Jerusalem, but they would rule over it. And after some time, the city streets were cleaned up from the war, homes were rebuilt, markets opened again, and a hundred years later, Christians, Jews, and Muslims were living in the great city together, working together, living together. But after a hundred years, Things were about to change again. In our next episode, we're going to look at the Second Crusade through the eyes of a young girl who travels to Jerusalem to see the place of her birth. But her visit is ill-timed, and war breaks out while she's there. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, if you want to know more about Islam versus Christianity, I have an entire video series on my website. I have a lot of video series on my websites on a lot of different topics, such as abortion and euthanasia, Bible studies on the book of Revelation and Daniel, and I have a lot more really great things coming. There's also three different podcasts right now and more coming soon. So you really want to check that out. Go to lauraleesiemens.com, lauraleesiemens.com. That's where all of that content is. All right, I will see you again next week. We're going to be talking about the second.